Uh, our next speaker is Dan Tapiero. Uh, Dan is uh, a very well-known uh, investor. He has uh, been in Bitcoin for quite a long time now. Um, and when I first met Dan, somebody uh, had originally introduced me to him as Dan has a bunch of billionaire friends. They all run in this billionaire circle and uh, they're getting excited about Bitcoin. That was probably 2020, I think. And I remember clear as day, I said, okay, that sounds great. But I've seen Dan tweeting about inflation, uh, monetary policy, and the strength of the dollar. And I think I begged you to get on a phone call. And I said, explain this to me like I'm five. And you did. You did a fantastic job. So maybe walk us through like, how do you think about Bitcoin with the macro backdrop? And how much of what you were evaluating in 2020 and kind of getting excited about still remains true today, even though the macro backdrop has changed, we're at high interest rates and Bitcoin's at an all-time high? Okay, well, first of all, I want to say happy to be here. I, I love this turnout. Um, you know, I don't understand why there aren't more events in New York City. I mean, uh, it, it, it's crazy to think there are 30 million people in and around New York, and I don't know, what are there, five or six events, etc. So it was a great idea, I think, to start this. Um, you know, billionaire friends. Now, I, I worked for a bunch of billionaire guys, right? I think that's what it is. Um, some are friends, but no, I, I, I think that was the, the uh, initial introduction. And then I do remember that call, by the way, when you asked me, like this macro stuff. I think Raul Powell had said some things and you said to me, well, what, is, what does that mean exactly? And it was about the dollar too, which can be very confusing. Um, yeah, many- I also have a small brain, so I needed well, a big no, brain to explain it. You know, but it's not something uh, I say, you know, the, the dollar, the dollar euro, um, it's, um, it's not always straightforward what fundamentals are driving it. So I, I think with, with Bitcoin, it's actually more simple. It's less vague. Um, but the macro case uh, today, uh, frankly, I think is probably better than when it was when we spoke in, I think it was 2019, 20. Um, you know, just a lot of different ways we can take this, but to think that the short rate in the US is 5%, okay, and Bitcoin is now at an all time high, is not something that I think any of the macro people really uh, anticipated. Uh, most of the people in the macro world were thinking, okay, well, Bitcoin only goes up because rates are negative, right? And this all was post-08, um, you know, Bitcoin was invented and the idea was that uh, real interest rates would be negative for a very long period of time. And so uh, that was true. And it made sense that an asset um, of limited supply would go up in that environment. And of course, you were losing, you know, two to 3% annually um, you know, that was the negative rate, the negative interest rate for quite a while. So over a 10-year period, you were going to lose 30, 40, 50% of your savings in real terms. Um, so many of the macro people thinking about Bitcoin within that context, um, at least it could make sense, right? It's, a, uh, you know, you're de uh, hedging against the debasement of fiat, right? But now that the real rate is not zero, and that in fact, the short rate is 5%, um, I think it's really signaling to that macro group that maybe something else is going on. So what's remarkable is that it's 15 years since the invention of Bitcoin. And some of these guys who are phenomenal investors, only thinking now that maybe something else is going on. It's not just a hedge against the debasement of fiat, right? Of course, and Bitcoin is many, many different things. Um, so when you say, is it better uh, or what is it compared to 2020? Um, I think uh, I just never and I don't think anyone would have anticipated that we'd be this strong um, given where the rate is. So yeah. how, how are some macro funds or macro traders thinking about Bitcoin in the sense of, okay, there is something else going on. Is that 
unlocking them to start investing? The ones who were invested, are they putting more exposure on? What, what, what is kind of um, the, once they get to a conclusion mentally and from a psychological standpoint, what are they actually doing? Well, I mean, maybe you recall or not, but I've left that world behind, uh, thankfully. Um, not a lot of return, broadly speaking, in that world. And the old macro world is actually quite boring. Um, I Look, I think the people at those big funds who you know, the well-known guys, you know, they've done so well investing in the old framework. Um, you know, you saw, of course, a few years ago, Paul Tudor Jones's comments, and every once in a while he'll come out and say, you know, he owns a little bit of it. But I don't think any of them uh, have really done sort of the super deep dive that would um, allow them to only focus on this. And, you know, the guys from my background, Mike Novo, who you had this morning, Dan Moorhead, I mean, I've known those guys 20 and 30 years. Um, you know, they're a little younger than those older guys, and they, they made the transition completely because this really is the and I say this a lot, this is the greatest macro bet of all time on Bitcoin, on the digitization of all assets, on the, um, you know, the, the fact that I think all value is eventually going to sit somewhere on some blockchain and, and live in this digital asset ecosystem. So, um, you know, I, I, I really don't think that the commitment to the space is there, certainly, and then it, amongst the sort of older macro guys, but then also, you know, even the prominent long short equity guys, um, you know, there's three trillion dollars in that hedge fund business. Um, and I, I mean, there are a handful of people. I think the ETF, as it becomes more liquid, so it's not really liquid for a proper fund for trading purposes. I think it'll become super liquid, just like the gold ETF, which was introduced in 2000. In the beginning, wasn't liquid. Um, and then the actual the options on the GLD became the place, uh, super liquid, um, super liquid. I think that will eventually happen within the next sort of maybe two, three, four years. That um, And then when it becomes liquid, all of those guys will be trading actively and um, but to me, that's really less interesting. I think the way to really build wealth, if that's what you care about, um, is just to hodl as you know, you and I've talked a lot about, I, I know it's crazy to think you can just sit there and be long, um, and not do anything. Right. But I I'm experiencing it. You've experienced it. Hopefully everyone in the audience here has experienced it. It's kind of crazy. Right. It's how is that possible? Right. That you don't have to go out and sweat and, you know, uh, work 18 hours a day. And all of a sudden, you know, your, your wealth is building. And it's because you've taken a risk that other people, literally 99 percent of the people out there are not willing to take because they're not willing to do the work. So I love this concept of proof of work uh, algorithm. Right. You did the work, you're sitting there. Some people just get lucky and uh, have their gut feel and they buy something and they come back, you know, in five years and uh, it's done well for them. But the reality is, is that you're getting compensated. This is from a financial markets, you know, portfolio management perspective. You're getting compensated for taking that risk. And so uh, I think you continue to get compensated. Um, I mean, Kathy's uh, prediction or estimate of where it goes is nice. Um, but she didn't give you a time period. And that's the, a little bit of a problem because macro, macro takes its time to play out sometimes. And it doesn't, you know, I always say that, um, and this is many years being involved with gold, um, gold never does what you want it to do when you want it to do it. So it's a very, very frustrating thing, unless you're just long. Um, that was in the old world. And I think it's the same thing here that at least in this cycle, I would say, you know, 200 to 300,000, I think is reasonable in the next 12, 24 months, it might happen more quickly. But um, as she rightly said, the ETF uh, is very important. Um, we could talk about that more if you want in a sec. But I, I think longer term, sure, you can put any number you want on it. Uh, 20 years, uh, you know, could go anywhere. But I think there's there's too much also that can happen between now and 20 years from now. So 
I, I, I would put a little more of a, you know, I'm not a short-term guy at all, but I think that that's sort of the first target. Let's talk about Bitcoin and gold. Uh, okay, you are we did that talk you, on that that one time. Yeah, right? you, you, well, you are one of the people that I think has done a ton of work on gold. Has a very strong understanding of that market. Uh, has been right for the most part when it comes to gold. Um, but unlike uh, my uncle Peter Schiff, he's not really my uncle, but he's basically my uncle, um, who has stayed kind of stuck in that world. You've been able to say, no, it's not an either or. It can be an and type situation with Bitcoin. So how do you look at gold and Bitcoin, similarities, differences, and how do you think institutions, if you go to central banks all the way down to you know financial organizations, are going to look at these assets in their portfolio? These, these double questions you have to stop with. I'm terrible. You got to ask one and I'll do that and then I'll move on. I, uh, um, Today's episode is brought to you by Proppy. Imagine a world where you could buy and sell your home wallet to wallet. With Prop Keys, you can mint your home address and upgrade it to a real world asset. This not only protects your home's title from fraud, but when you are ready to move, you can sell it through an NFT auction as well as through the traditional way. There's optionality here. Proppy Keys is part of the Proppy ecosystem. Their mission is to make home ownership more efficient, affordable, and user friendly. Proppy Keys is a fun entry point to placing title on the blockchain. Now, anyone can start their on chain journey by minting home addresses via Proppy Keys and staking them for profit until they are ready to sell their home. Visit proppykeys.com to learn more. Again, that's proppykeys.com to learn more. I don't know why you'd ever met, mentioned Peter Schiff ever um, in, within any context. And He's my uncle. And certainly not in an investing or proper one uh, context. But um, I, I don't know. Uh, he's uh, sort of not what about really a relevant player. Okay. How do you think so, about gold? Look, I mean, clearly Bitcoin will continue to outperform gold. Um, you know, I, I have a physical gold business, sales and storage business called GBI. I launched it in 08. We're today the third largest vaulter of gold in the world outside the banking system. Traded gold since the 90s, done a lot of work and uh, I've thought a lot about it. And Look, gold is a great hedge uh, within the old world. So there's the fiat world. And so there's all the value and all the assets that exist in the fiat world. Bonds, uh, stocks, commodities, uh, currencies. And if you're worried about that system and you're of that system, then gold is a great hedge for that. Um, you know, it, it hedge against the debasement of fiat. Um, and... You know, there are a lot of great characteristics, um, but of course, Bitcoin has all of that and then a lot more. And um, so I, I, I suspect, I mean, it'll be easy for Bitcoin to outperform gold. Um, you know, I have this sort of different view about this whole thing, which is that I think that the entire fiat world, so the call it five to $700 trillion of assets that exist, if you just add everything up, the real estate, you know, the art, the, the money, the money supply, you add it all up. All of that is slowly, and in that case it's a bit, slowly devaluing against everything in this new world. It's not just Bitcoin. If you look at the last 10 years, every single asset in the old world, is down 99% against Bitcoin. Everyone, S&P, NASDAQ, you know, of course, Bitcoin was starting from a low number, but you know, it's the same thing for Ethereum. In the last eight years, every single asset, no matter what, bonds. And so, and it, it's even true with some of these crappier cryptocurrencies that you'd never invest a dollar in, um, or a Bitcoin in, and I, I think, even they have gone up exponentially against all the assets in the old world. So for me, you know, it was easy to make a break because I saw my purchasing power getting destroyed. I'm sitting there in all the old world investments and, you know, okay, you have a 10% move or up 20 or 30%, but the everything in this digital asset economy uh, is, is crushing it. So, why is that important? I think because, you know, there's this idea that the fiat world is over leveraged. There's too much debt. 
And I don't ever think that we're going to have a government default or a debt jubilee. None of that happens um, it, because it would be too cataclysmic. But what happens, and what does happen, is that that whole world, which is, which is over leveraged, um, and th there are too many bonds, uh, devalues slowly against the new world, where, in a sense, there is a finite supply and it is, there's no leverage, zero leverage. No one will lend to anybody in the digital asset world. I own 24 companies in the space. No one is lending them any money. So I think it's a, if you think about things in those big, broad terms, it does make sense to exit as much as you can of the old. I mean, you have to have real estate. You live in a house or whatever it is. But um, so that's how I, I think about it. And I think it's never been, uh, there's never been a stronger case. So as you are converting value from the old world into the new world, um, there's a lot of different investment opportunities. You can own companies, you can own uh, existing liquid tokens, you can own soon-to-be liquid tokens that are not equity, but they're kind of more like early stage investing. There's growth, there's all these different components. How do you think about where you put capital and uh, how many different areas do you want to be invested in? Yeah, I mean, it's an extremely complex world. And if you're just entering and you just say to me, oh, I just want to own Bitcoin, I think that's just fine. And, you know, I just want to own the ETF too. Even that is fine, even though I would prefer, I wouldn't do the ETF. But, but I'm just saying that's a, for new people who are just coming into the space, that's great. Um, but, you know, as an investor, you can't do absolutely everything in one thing, I guess, unless you're Michael Saylor. I mean, Michael, you know, 100% just in Bitcoin and this thing. But so I, my, my view generally is that you should have a bit of a portfolio. You have Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum. I think those are the two core assets of the space. Um, Bitcoin more core, but anyway, I, I know a lot of people disagree with that, but I think that network effect is, has been achieved and um, Everything else is probably a venture project in my mind. Uh, maybe Solana's transitioning, I, I don't know. Um, but then, so you decide what percentage you want your portfolio to break down, Bitcoin, ETH, and then you have a little bit of a venture fund because there's crazy Wild West stuff going on in the space and you might want to have some exposure to that. And then a little bit in a growth fund. And that's what I do. And as far as I know, we're still the only growth equity fund in the world that's exclusively focused on crypto, blockchain, Web3, digital assets, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's how my portfolio is structured. Yeah. Why are you guys the only one? Does that I don't mean know. That it makes no sense to me. Um, I would have thought by now, I mean, I had the idea for this in 2019, and I would have thought there would be 10 or 20 guys. In fact, what's happened is a few of them came in and uh, crossover funds in 20. Uh, 21 and 22, you know, very famous guys, Toma Bravo and Silver Lake, Tiger, Code 2, all of these, Tomasic, all these big players. And unfortunately, you know, there are landmines all over the space and they stepped on a few and FTX, uh, thankfully we passed on them three times, but um, FTX hurt them and he, he hurt the reputation uh, of the space for more traditional players and growth equity players. So they moved out, they've been moving out. Um, and if you're in venture, uh, I don't know who is gonna fund, you know, the rounds two years from now, you know, you do the seed or an A round. I, I don't know where the money is gonna come from. It's, our estimate is this 30 to $50 billion of, of growth that is equity that is gonna be needed in the next two to four years the next for the next stage of the of the winners from the venture area right so i don't know why uh i i, I basically you know i someone asked me that every day and i i have no i have no idea why you know what is the thought process um in venture with what i'll call growth illiquid equity versus growth investing in these like liquid protocols that if they were not in crypto, they would oh. be more like early stage startups. Oh, I mean, there's like, I mean, it just shows you how early we are. I mean, there's zero interest or ability in the early stage protocols. I mean, it just is so hard to understand for traditional people. 
Um, I think it's more simple, you know, understand that Coinbase is a great business. It's, Coinbase is essentially the only public company, large crypto uh, public company in the world. Um, the question really is, you know, not only where are the, the growth equity guys, but why aren't there more companies? You have some of the miners, of course, and you have, you know, Mike's firm, Galaxy, it's smaller. Um, I suspect that over the next sort of three, two, three, five years, I'm not exactly sure, but in that times that we're going to have many public companies um, that are, you know, from the space. I, I see sort of emerge emerging um, I, uh, of the equity in the token world. I, I don't see equity going away tomorrow. There's a established sort of system of value. Um, and also the laws are very clear and there's lots of uh, legal precedent, um, especially with bankruptcy laws. In the crypto space, you know, there's no precedent and all sorts of stuff goes on that shouldn't go on. So I, I don't see equity going away. I just think they sort of you know, merge somewhere in the future. But very long term, I think you could make the case that there may not be equity. You know, 20 years or something, 15, 20 years, that everything may just uh, be tokenized. So the Bitcoin network, to some degree, is this, right? In the sense that uh, there was no equity. It was um, just a token. You buy it. You don't necessarily own the network by owning it, but you have a piece of the network. Um, how do you look at that asset when some people say, look, it's a store of value. That's all we need it to be. It's kind of, quote, unquote, digital gold, and that's good enough, versus maybe the other end of the spectrum, which is, you know, it becomes a global reserve currency and is used as a medium of exchange and a unit of account. Like, where in that spectrum is kind of your nor North Star that Bitcoin ends up? That is really hard. Um, you know, I, I always just think about what do I do with my Bitcoin, which is it's just in a vault, right? Hardware wallet finished. Like I don't, I'm not going to stake it. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to spend it. So that may not be the way the future unfolds. Um, I mean, the, the use case. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's an incredible asset. Um, I, I actually, I'm not really sure, like, is it used for absolutely everything and by everybody and that's it? You know, I don't know. Human beings, uh, you know, like to have some variation uh, and like like to choose, even if the choices are wrong. Um, you know, I always say, uh, like, if you may think McDonald's has the best burger, uh, but then, you know, you have Burger King and Wendy's and you have burgers. People make all different kinds of burgers. Right? I mean, can we all agree that there's only one thing that is it? Um, I, I don't know, just looking at the human uh, behavioral pattern, it just seems to me to be hard. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think, look, theoretically, could it be everything? Yeah, I mean, it, it could be. But I think that's a hard bet to make, right? Like it's a hard, like you, you can be happy with the asset and um, it, it not get all the way to, you know, all money to all people all the time. Yeah. What about um, sovereign wealth funds, nation states, you know, these large, large pools of capital? Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is, um, you know, there's some countries in the world that are very, very large. If they were to go buy Bitcoin and take self-custody of it, they would be expressing financial exposure, but they also would be introducing this geopolitical conversation. And I think the U.S. and others would be mm. like, what are you doing? But now with the ETFs, they may be able to express the financial exposure to price without having to introduce the geopolitical conversation because they actually don't own Bitcoin. They own shares in the ETF. So will, is that like kind of a green light for them to start to allocate? Yeah, I mean, we are light years away from that, I think. I mean, I know there was some talk about these are Qatar or Oman or one of these Middle Eastern countries. Um, and if they bought something, it was probably de minimis. So... I, I mean, everyone in the audience should be happy about this because it's very early. And I think at some point they will all own Bitcoin. Um, and that's, I don't want to say an infinite amount of money, but I mean, it is nearly infinite, right? Because many of them can print whatever they feel like. 
um, you know, some have repercussions on their local currency. Uh, the U.S. doesn't really. Um, so I, I, I don't think they're anywhere. I, I don't know what, what makes you, do you, have you heard of some big central banks buying? I mean, I've, I, the people I speak to, I only know one central banker uh, who I think is advanced uh, in this area. And uh, I don't even think that central bank will be able to buy for years. Um, I think central banks are looking at it. They're researching all that. So it's kind of early on that side. Uh, but I do think that there's a number of countries that are much further along than people realize. Um, a big ones or I mean, very I big ones. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, a lot of them may just say, hey, the safe thing to do is like, let's build infrastructures. Let's do mining um, again. You know, I actually think we don't give other national leaders enough credit for them understanding the geopolitical complexity. Um, and so if you are a country that, you know, sometimes is nice with the U S sometimes not, this is like kind of throwing like a Molotov cocktail into a room. Like you probably don't want to do that. I mean, you know, funnily enough in the last, I think six to nine months, the central bank buying of gold, which I'm sure nobody in the room really watch, looks at, but has exploded dramatically. And I, it's all part of the U S having, I think, taken, uh, Russia's reserves, uh, you know, uh, when they made a certain political decision, geopolitical decision, they, they just took so, the reserves. So other people and, you know, the Arab countries, their currency is still completely pegged to the dollar. So they have no diversification at all uh, within their assets. Right. So there's a paper uh, from a gentleman at the Harvard School of Economics, I believe. And basically what he tried to look at was Bitcoin as a sanctions hedge. So being introduced into central banking, not for price or kind of economic reasons, but purely as a sanctions hedge. Um, and his conclusion was it would make sense. The Did anyone is, read that paper or was it just you? <laughs> I read it. <laughs> I, that's what I mean, it was just you. Yeah. I, well, I haven't even heard of this paper. But, but, here, but here's the, the part that's interesting to me about it, right, is um, central banks and other large pools of capital, we all sit up here and talk about them as this, if they're just economic actors. But when you're acting on behalf of a pension fund, uh, a, a nation state, et cetera, you actually may make decisions not for economic reasons, but for you know, nationalist reasons. Yeah, I mean, that's the infinite bid scenario. I, I actually think, you know, if I were a central banker, uh, I would definitely be buying. Um, and I don't think... I don't think it's that far, like, I think they can understand it. I think it's very hard to get a buy-in. And, you know, I see this when, you know, we have a few institutional investors. I've got the Texas Teachers Pension Funds invested $30 million with us and the Michigan Pension Fund, MERS. And you've got to understand, every time you have a, after a pension, not only do you go through a year of, of diligence, but you have to get through a committee and the committee has seven people or 19 people. And as a central bank, uh, the same thing. You can imagine everyone sitting around the table. All you need is one or two people to veto it or a few people. Um, so I think it's very hard to get the buy-in, even though by now, I mean, there's enough literature out there. I mean, the Harvard paper you mentioned, but there, there's a ton of literature out there that suggests it's a, it's a good idea even just as, as a hedge. Um, uh, but it, it's very hard. It still is hard. Yeah. The, um, the last question that I have is around custody itself. Um, I think that obviously big institutions, they need qualified custodians and, and all of that. But how do you see Bitcoin playing out more at the kind of, you know, middle market or retail level? Does Bitcoin fully well, it's become easy. a self Every, Everybody will just, at least in the U.S., will just buy the ETF. You have your, uh, you, you know, call up your broker. You put your order in. I think that's the, we haven't talked about it, but the power of this thing is that you've onboarded literally, you know, a hundred trillion dollars of value sitting in global equity accounts in one day. So... I mean, I don't know. That's like uh, Coinbase adding 100 million, you know, monthly active users or I, I don't know, maybe multiple 100 million. I, I, I don't know. So I, I think um, for the, you know, certainly Americans, but, you know, the higher echelon like Wealth Group who own equity or have other financial assets, 
Um, it just, this is a huge, uh, a huge deal. And I, I mean, I think self custody is, is important, but you, people don't necessarily get there day one. And the ETF I think is great because it's a, it really is an easy first step, right? And then they make a little investment and then they start doing a little work and then they buy a ledger and then they're like, oh, well, you know, what are all these other things going on in this space? Like, why are all these people focused on this? Why is there three and a half trillion dollars of value sitting here? And that's when people start to uh, get the light bulb moment. But it's not it's not easy. So I wouldn't be too hard on the people who are not getting it. You you as you know, you have to be dedicated and. You doing events like this, I think, is fantastic um, because it gets the word out. Yeah. Everything I learned, I learned from Dan. I appreciate it, my friend. <laughs>